Hi, everyone, and thank you for joining us tonight. We're really excited for tonight's topic, part two in a series of three. We're going more in depth about treatment options and therapeutic ingredients. But before we get started, there's just a few things to mention. If you have questions, type them into the question box on the right-hand side of your screen. We'll have some time at the end for a Q&A. If we run out of time, though, we'll get back to you by email. So don't hesitate. Keep those questions coming. And if anyone wants to learn more, contact us to schedule a meeting with you and your team. With that out of the way, I'd like to introduce Dr. Kim Cooch, CEO and founder of Carry Free. Dr. Cooch has been successfully practicing dentistry for 35 years, and he still practices three days a week here in Albany, Oregon. He's the world's leading authority on ATP as it relates to Carrie's risk assessment. So, Dr. Cooch, I'll let you take it from here. All right, great. Hey, thank you, Lacey. So, uh, welcome everybody to part two here on Dental Carries of Disease of Choice. And uh, I tell you, it, I always uh, enjoy doing these webinars, and I'm always, uh, I guess, humbled by how many people uh, tune in. So, I hope that you find tonight's interesting and worthwhile. I want to start um, with the usual suspects, and there's a method to my madness here tonight because I want to talk about you know where we go when we talk to our patients. Um, and so, you know, a lot of you have seen this before. We have some people tonight that this is one of their first webinars. Uh, but you know, I, I want to look at this is really about pattern recognition, and I want you to start thinking and looking at your patients and seeing like what's the pattern that's causing this disease because I've been doing this risk assessment for 15 years now, and I see these common patterns in patients that stand out, that if you can just identify that pattern, it really helps you narrow down really quickly what you're going to do with your treatment decisions and where you need to go from there. So based on about 13,000 patients that we have in our database now, the number one risk factor that we see self-reported is they feel like they have a dry mouth. So 63% of the patients self-report that they feel like they have a dry mouth at some time during the day or night. And so that's really a salivary issue and primarily related to medication. The second on that list is diet. And typically, 55% of the patients responded that they either are eating too much sugar or that they're snacking too frequently during the day or drinking other things other than water uh, frequently during the day. Third on that list is bacteria. And those are patients that report seeing a lot of plaque buildup on their teeth or that we identify that have a highly active biofilm by using ATP bioluminescence. One that we really can't measure, but is really, a, um, I think, a, a lot of research has been done uh, in the last four or five years, a real focus. And we're coming to understand that genetics plays a very important role in dental caries. But at the end of the day, I know this is all about pH, and it's, uh, you know, having these prolonged periods of low pH in the mouth that, um, you know, they correlate to a shift in the in the biofilm behavior and population and ends up in uh, a net mineral loss of the teeth. So I want to talk tonight a little bit just about saliva, diet, and bacteria. And so, and really to get you to start thinking about that pattern recognition, this is my current risk assessment form. Like I said, I've been doing this for 15 years. So what you're seeing here tonight is an accumulation of my 15 years of study uh, and clinical experience with patients. As I've tried to narrow this down and make this as simple as and logical as possible, um, and and so I really want to look at um, the risk assessment form. And we start with, uh, if you go here, you can see that there are green uh, answers in the column here. You know, on the, the patient uh, use, the top part of the form, they fill out the risk factors. And to the right, or if there, those are answers are yes, that you know puts them into a moderate risk category. And then down below, then we have this is all from John Featherstone's work at UCSF and his team, the disease indicators, uh, the four standard disease indicators. And then again, we've got by the ADA definition, we have you know low risk, moderate risk, and high risk. Uh, and then we have the CD codes that, that correspond to that. But the real benefit of doing any of this, this is you know my mentor and friend John Coys. Uh, the real benefit of the risk assessment form is not to figure out whether the patient has its high risk. I don't care how many cavities they have. I, it's you know we all get lost, and I think when we start doing this and trying to figure out, you know, I want this risk assessment form to be this diagnostic form, and really the the whole benefit. This is like you're playing Columbo here, and what I want to know is who done it. 
I, I, we've got the dead body, we've got the cavities, I, we got the murder weapon. I, I want to figure out why is this person getting cavities? Because if I can identify that correctly, I can help coach the patient back to health. I can put them on a path uh, that obviously they have to be the major participant in, but I can help put them back in a path and give them direction so that they can get a healthy mouth again. So it's really the whole goal of this thing is really to find um, what's causing their decay. So when we look at you know the risk assessment forms, you know, and how many people are doing caries risk assessment in private practice, it's very discouraging. When we look at surveys, this one was published this last in last year, uh, a survey of 547 general practitioners in Texas. Uh, very few people are doing caries risk assessment, and I have to tell you, without having a form, without going through the standardized, just going through the routine. That form is your checklist, and it, and, and it makes you go through that every time with every patient. And you identify things that you would have missed. Um, so one of the challenges we've got is, as a, as a profession, we're not doing it. We're not utilizing this base of knowledge that we have. Um, and then even the ones that are doing it, we're not really tying our therapies to an individualized treatment plan based on what we found out from the risk assessment form. So I think too often we go through this exercise to figure out whether they're high risk or, or not, and we don't really take full advantage of the real benefit, which is finding out why the patient's getting cavities. One of the other chat, one other survey that was published last year also indicated the reason by survey that we're not doing it is number one, we don't get paid for it. Uh, although that's changing, you know, uh, Delta Dental is you know now reimbursing on these DT codes in some zones across the country. Um, so that's that's one issue, and the other issue is that uh, in most dentists we've not been trained on how to do this, and so most dentists feel uncomfortable doing. They're not really certain how to do it, and so they really don't know how, and so they don't know how to do it. We don't get paid for it, so it doesn't get done. So that's a real challenge for us. However, we do know that um, the carries risk assessment. This was a study published last year by John Featherstone and his group. Uh, we know that the baseline carries risk is very predictive. So if you're high risk, and there have been a number of studies that also demonstrate this, um, that if you're high risk on your baseline, you're going to develop more cavities if it's left untreated, if we don't address what's causing the issue. Um, and so it's predictive. So we can look at that baseline and know, I tell the patient with confidence, you know, if you don't make these changes, you're going to have more decay. And we can even predict about how many cavities you're going to have in the next 12 to 18 months as well. So you know that's really valuable information to give to patients because I, I, as I talk to patients more and more, you know, compared to 15 years ago, they are so much more educated and more interested in their health. Um, even I talked to a patient today about her blood pressure, and, and she wanted to, you know, know what her blood pressure was and why I was concerned about it. And as I explained it to her, she says, "My doctors never talked to me about that. I'm taking blood pressure medication because I, you know, I know my blood pressure medication was high, but." He never told me what the risk of having high blood pressure are. And I, I sat there kind of dumbfounded, but that's healthcare today, right? Um, so we know that Del Carey's risk assessment is a good baseline predictor. We also know that uh, it, it works. There's an outcome. This was a study, again, published uh, by John Featherstone and his group at UCSF. But we know that it provides, it's an effective outcome going through Carey's risk assessment. And in this study, they looked at 2,724 adults over a period of 18 months, and for they were giving, they compared giving patients um, on a monthly basis, putting products in their hands. In, in this case, it was I think chlorhexidine rinse and fluoride rinse and an 1,100 part per million standard fluoride toothpaste, and a little bit of education encouragement versus just handing that to them one time. And what they found was that it, it, for every three patients treated, it, it dropped their score by one DMFT. So we know that it provides an outcome. Uh, so we get results by practicing with Canberra. When we look at that over a long period of time, this was a modeling study that was done in terms of cost effectiveness in the Australian population. And we know that it's cost effective. It saves the system and the patient's money over time. And I, I got to tell you, so I think a lot of dentists think, oh, so we're going to make less money. The reality is, and it's been my experience, and a lot of people have been doing this for a long time, once you get that patient healthy and they stop getting cavities, instead of spending dollars begrudgingly on, you know, maintaining and, and refilling teeth and you know treating cavities, you know, 
they opt to spend their money on a lot more elective and cosmetic procedures and maybe more full restorative type care. So, you know, it's cost effective for the system, um, but that doesn't mean you're going to be doing less dentistry. So I, I just want to make sure everybody kind of understands that. It is cost effective for the system. The other thing, this study was published in uh, December of last year, and I thought it was very interesting as well. Um, this was a study where they put patients through a CAMBRA program, and then they looked at their decrease in their DMFT scores as a result of the program, and basically versus the control, it reduced their decay rate by 28%. Now this is where it gets interesting. They did nothing then, and they just called all these patients back four years later. And just having gone through that CAMBRA program four years earlier, they still maintain a, a lower DMFT score than the control group, like four years later. So that we know that this has long-term results with patients. Putting them through a CAMBRA program may change, obviously changes their behavior and changes their outlook or their, uh, their dental IQ. So four years post-op, they still had the same result as they had at, immediately at the end of the study. And then this was another paper published uh, by Featherstone and, and his group. Um, and again, they went back and did secondary analysis, and they said, this is really interesting. We got this result. We, we had these 109 patients that had one to seven um, cavities. They were all high risk. We followed them for 24 months, and we got this outcome. We reduced their decay rate by 24%. And so the question was, well, let's go back and look at the data and figure out what caused the effect. Was it the chlorhexidine rinse that we used? Was it the, uh, the 1,100 part per million fluoride toothpaste? Was it the 0.05% fluoride rinse? What caused the effect? What was the major benefit? Which one of these three things did cause the result? And when they went back, they found that 1 plus 1 plus 1 equal like 5. And so there was another factor that suddenly it was greater, the, the results were greater than the sum of the individual parts when they analyzed the data. So it's like there's actually, they termed this then the Canberra effect, that there's actually an improved outcome even beyond what you would expect from your therapies just by putting them through this entire system. And it's something that, that either they hadn't measured, hadn't taken into account, or, or weren't able to measure. And some of that may be behavioral, some of it may be attitudinal. You know, I, we don't know what it is, but I can tell you that having that shotgun effect on them produced a greater result than the individual sum of the parts. And so there's a camber effect, and that's well established. Now, we looked at this patient. Um, we started with this patient in our last webinar. And so here's this young lady. She's like 22 years old. She comes to me as a new patient. She's obviously got decay. She's got a, a bunch of different issues going on here. Um, and if you look at her photograph here, you know, start to ask yourself, do you think she has enough saliva? You know, does it look like she's got a lot of plaque buildup on her teeth? And when I see patients that have dietary issues, I typically send a CDK that's just kind of throughout the entire mouth. It's not, you know, it's not mostly in the pits and fissures. It's not mostly in the class five region. It's just kind of all over and everywhere. So, you know, those are the kind of patterns that I start to look for. So I saw this patient. I'm looking. I'm going. So what's going on? That is her bite. She's got an anterior open bite. She might be a mouth breather. You see the gingival inflammation there. There may be some airway issues. So we got all of those things complicating this as well. But I want to know what's causing this decay, particularly in her mouth. And she, I mean, she's yes, pretty much all the way down the list here. Do you notice black buildup on your teeth? Are you taking medications? Yes. Uh, do you feel like you have a dry mouth? What are you drinking? And you know, so we went through this. And so this person is high risk. She has all the disease indicators, and she has she's high risk, and she's a, a DO603 on the risk assessment form. So she she's high risk for dental caries. You know, I mean, that's kind of a duh. You can see cavities on her teeth. You know, if you just if you just look. But the real point. I want to get to here is so what's causing her disease and if we can figure that out that's how we can best help her if we just do Dr. Drill and Phil on her you know and we don't correct what's causing this you know and I know that in two years three years from now she's going to be sitting back on our chair with a mouthful of cavities all over again and we'll be doing this again and like how many times do we have to do that before we stop and go okay that's really a stupid approach um, so the next step once we have this risk assessment done is to go to our diagnosis and um, we don't have any diagnostic codes. That's a whole other topic we won't discuss tonight. But when you come down to your diagnosis for this patient, it's really about taking all of your data, all of your information, your radiographs, your history with the patient, 
uh, your risk assessment form, the results of your uh, intraoral exam, if you use a biometric like ATP bioluminescence or if you're culturing, you take all of that data and then you come together and go, okay, is this person low risk, moderate risk, or high risk for dental caries? And that really becomes your diagnosis. Um, for me, I'm using ATP bioluminescence. I'm going to talk about that just a little bit right here, but you have other options. Uh, you can certainly measure pH. Um, I, we've studied that and a number of people have studied that and the pH varies so much during the, you know, the stiff on curve in the 24 hour period of time that just taking a spot check on the pH in different areas of the mouth really don't seem to correlate to anything other than I think it's probably a good educational tool. You can culture bacteria. I did that for a couple of years. It's, uh, the culture kits aren't that accurate and it takes time and you got to have an oven and it doesn't lend itself well to real-time testing. It's a 48-hour culture. Uh, you've got monoclonal um, antibody tests for mutant streptococci. Um, some of those are on the market. Again, that's just measuring one bacteria and, it, and it, that's, just, that's a procedure that takes about 15 minutes and 12 steps to perform. Uh, and then you've got ATP bioluminescence, which is like a 15-second chair-side test. And it gives you a real accounting for the bacterial load in the mouth. And then um, you can kind of take that information and then interpret it from there. One of the reasons that I asked that question a lot of years ago was we know that these acid uric bacteria maintain, while they have different stress features that they're capable of surviving with um, in an acidic environment, uh, the greatest thing that they do is they have a hydrogen ion pump. And so inside of their cell, they're able to pump the hydrogen ions back outside of the cell. And so they can maintain a pH of at least 5.5 and above in their cytoplasm, while they could be in a, in a pH environment that, say, is like 3 or 2. And yet, they, so they're kind of an extremophile, and they've learned how to adapt and survive by doing that. And so that's their mechanism. The thing is, it takes about 100 times as much ATP for that bacteria in that environment as it would like in a neutral environment. So I asked the question, does ATP bioluminescence, would that be a marker, biomarker for this disease? And it turned out that, yes, that in fact is the case. So we did a bunch of independent studies at University of Oregon Health Sciences uh, University. And, been, and this has been studied at a number of universities throughout the country. Uh, but, you know, some of the first studies, and this is from a textbook that was actually published on bioluminescence and um, in, in the application of dentistry, and you can see that we had a high correlation between uh, actually total bacterial count, total streptococci per sample, and then total uh, strep mutans as well had a high correlation. And then it, we even found a, a strong correlation to their caries risk um, in the studies that we did. So. Uh, it's not it's not a perfect test, but it, it gives you a good baseline on whether the person has a bacterial issue or not. Um, so one thing I would that I use the bioluminescence for when I'm going through my diagnosis is I use it to determine whether or not I'm going to put them on an antimicrobial agent. You know, if they have a bacterial problem, you know, I'm going to put them on an antimicrobial agent like the CTX4 treatment rinse. Uh, if they don't have a bacterial issue, like if they have a low ATP score and, and you don't see a lot of plaque on their teeth, you're dealing with something else. You're either dealing with a dietary issue or you're dealing with more likely probably a salivary issue or lack of saliva. But other studies that were done on this indicated use in children. It uh, is potentially a, a, a valid risk assessment tool in children. Um, this paper was just presented this year at the AADR by Alan Wong and his group down at, at UOP. I found a strong correlation uh, on the patients looking at high risk versus low risk and their ATP scores. So again, this has been studied over and over again, and so it's something that I feel very comfortable using with my patients in terms of um, taking it as a baseline, and then also using it as a biometric as we're further into treatment. When do you stop? When do you stop with some of these therapies? How do you know? I mean, if if you don't have some biometric you know, your biometric then becomes do they continue to get cavities or not. And, you know, that is a, a biometric, but, you know, 15 years ago I wasn't happy with, with that as a biometric. I wanted to be a little more scientific. So that's that's all we really need to talk about with ATP bioluminescence tonight. But So that's a biometric that's out there and it's available to you. Um, if we look at, this was 10 years ago, the ADA, Council on Scientific Affairs, published their definition of risk assessment categories. And this really has not changed. 
uh, in the last 10 years. Unfortunately, they published it in a supplement to, the, to JADA in August of that year on supplemental fluoride use. Um, and so, you know, a lot of people didn't read it. So a lot of, and this was buried in the middle of that article and that supplement. So a lot of people haven't really seen this. But I think that it's, you know, I think their definitions are pretty right on. Uh, like I say, they haven't changed much. Um, and what we're seeing, however, now is insurance companies are creating their own criteria and guidelines. And somebody asked me about that. I was like, well, where does this, where the study? I want to see the study where they came up with this definition. And I go, there, there isn't one. Right? I mean, we pull the, and the insurance companies, when, they, when their definition becomes uh, no incipient or cavitated lease in the last two years, or maybe one cavity in the last two years, and you're, that makes you low risk for all carriers, there isn't a study. They're making it up. I mean, we all are. We're just taking a shot in the dark because we don't have that data. doesn't mean it's not valid and we shouldn't use it. It just please understand that you know, we're using our best professional judgment to try and define this and create some parameters for us to work from. Uh, I think over time that we'll see some studies that will be able to like uh, address those specific um, categories directly. So my diagnostic guidelines, if you look at the risk assessment form, if you have only green answers, you are low risk and you don't have any, so that means you don't have any risk factors, that means you're healthy and that, that puts you in the CDT DO601 category. If you have one at least one yellow answer that makes you moderate risk for dental caries. And if you have at least one red answer, that makes you high risk. So, you know, I try to take Dr. Featherstone's data um, and put it in a simplified form and then just make it as simple as possible. If the answers are green, the patient gets a green dot. They're healthy. If, they're, if they have at least one yellow answer, they're moderate risk, and if they have at least one red answer, they're high risk, and you have those categories. I don't know how to make it more simple than that. I really, I don't know. I have, I've, had a, uh, I've had some ed educators say to me, God, it's so complicated. I can't make heads or tails of it. And I look at them, I think, really? Because I don't, that's, it doesn't get simpler than that. So anyway, that's, those are my categories to just try and nail that down. So it doesn't show in the right color here, but uh, uh, that high and all of those yes answers there that are circled in the red, those are all red answers. So this patient is high risk in a DO603. You know, as I spent time talking to the patient, she's on, uh, she's taking medications that dry out her mouth, and she's also has some dietary issues. She works uh, a late shift, and so she drinks uh, a lot of energy drinks, which are laced with sugar. Uh, when she's not drinking energy drinks, she was drinking like you know Coca-Cola and Mountain Dew. So, um, you know, so she has a couple of issues going on, and and you know, it's not a matter of just one, but so she has a couple of issues going on, and her home care could be better. So, you know, we we did have a high uh, bacterial count um, on the ATP score. So this is a patient. Then when I started thinking about what are we going to do in terms of therapy for her. Uh, I'm immediately thinking, okay, well, right out of the gate, we're going to an antimicrobial agent because we got a bacterial issue, and I want to just, you know, knock those bugs back um, out of the gate. So we look at then what kind of therapy are we going to provide for our patients? Um, we have different options that are available, and, and I, we talk about it. You know, you've got reparative, you've got therapeutic options, and you've got behavioral issues. And so starting with that, we've got remineralization with fluoride. You've got sealants, which are very important. Uh, that's a preventive, uh, a preventive approach. And then you've got drill and fill. I mean, you, you've still got to put some restorations in. I had a new patient this afternoon. My last patient this afternoon was a new patient uh, from out of town, referred to me by her dentist. And she has multiple issues going. It's going to be a large uh, treatment, um, and it's going to be you know a couple of years for us going through this. But at the start of this, I got to plug the holes. I got to, you know, I need to extract some root tips, um, and I need to plug the other holes as well. So, um, and maybe start using throwing some silver diamine fluoride even. But we've got to be able to, at some point in time, at least plug those holes. That's part of the, the therapy. If we look at some of the studies on fluoride varnish, I get a lot of questions on fluoride varnish. Does it work on all areas of the tooth? Does it work in approximately? Does it work in pit and fissures? And we know that it works better than any of the other vehicles that we could use fluoride with uh, because you have the substantivity because of the varnish that hangs around for a while. Um, I know that I was, we were told early on that was like for like six months 
and actually studies that have been done on that indicate it's more like 24 to 48 hours. But hey, that's significant during that during that window of time for remineralization. So this was a systematic review. This was uh, published in JADA uh, earlier this year. And there's a pretty general consensus in the profession if you're going to use fluoride and provide an in-office fluoride treatment, the way to go is with fluoride varnish. Now, taking that fluoride varnish, and the question that I've been asked is, well, does it work in, in occlusal fissures? Um, yeah, it does, but not as well as sealants. And so, and sealants even in an ICDOS 0 to 4, uh, you know, non-cavitated um, stage, sealants work, ex you know, extremely well. They've got the best outcome, but again, they have to be maintained. There's a couple of things that you have to consider when you look at these studies, because you and I have all seen the sealant bombs. You've seen those sealants fail in our own hands, and it's catastrophic at times, and I think we've all been unnerved by that. But when you look at sealants, there's, you've got to have isolation when you place them. You've got to have sound enamel. You can't bond to demineralized or aprismatic enamel. So you need to do a little preparation of some sort uh, on, those, on that enamel surface. And then number two, or number three rather, uh, you got to maintain it. So like here in this study, you know, they did this study over a period of uh, 12 months and looked at it. The majority of the sealants were, 73% were completely retained. Well, that's wonderful. That means 27% or one out of four basically were not completely retained. And that means we got to touch them up. So on those recare appointments with the kids that you've got sealants in, if you don't touch them, continually monitor and check them and touch them up, um, that's where you're going to end up with problems with, with pit and fissure sealants. So that's something that, you know, we just need to be clear about what that means when we say they're successful. Um, and again, this was a study that was published and looked at just sealing the four first permanent molars dramatically improved the outcome of decay over a period of time on seven to ten year olds over a five year period of time in school children. This was published and the study was done in Germany. But so looking at just four pit and fissure sealants significantly improved their outcome. So again, I think it's sealants are something that we need to, you know, use pretty universally on patients. There are some fissures that don't need sealants. You know, they're sound, they're intact, and they're never going to get decay. You know, so maybe it's not a good use of our resources or the system's resources to put sealants on those teeth. But I think most recommendations for um, from the ADA are at all at-risk teeth, which is pretty much all molars and and potentially premolars and and in all at-risk patients. So obviously, you know, the higher the, the carries risk for the patient, the more important that sealant is and the more important it is on their, certainly on their molars. So the studies really back that up. And this was like a study where they looked at zero to four ICDOS lesions. That means they're developing but non-cavitated, they're from healthy to non-cavitated. Um, and they found 100% effectiveness at 12 months and 98% effective at 44 months. But again, we need to repair and uh, continually monitor those pit and fissure sealants to make them be successful. But they do work. And so, I mean, the sealants should be part of our regimen here. Now, this study was published uh, actually in, the, uh, in JADA. Again, this came in, in uh, February and from Rec the Reckmans and Featherstone uh, from UCSF. And again, this was a study reviewing, you know, our approach to treating proximal lesions. So you can actually remineralize these lesions until they're at a D2 stage. Until they are cavitated, which means they're somewhere around a D1 to a D2 stage. Uh, I think the, the studies I've looked at indicate that when it's at a, a D1 stage uh, or it's at an E2 D1, it's at the DEJ, 85% of those lesions are not cavitated. They can still be remineralized. So we shouldn't be restoring the, those teeth. The, the lesions that you and I did preps on, class two preparations on for our board exams, uh, we should not be restoring those teeth. should at least have it, an opportunity to attempt to remineralize them and uh, give that patient that option at least. Um, so again, not only can we remineralize smooth surfaces, but we know that now that it's the scientific evidence is clear that we can remineralize these teeth as well. And at what point in time do you have the cutoff in approximately uh, is somewhere in that D1. Certainly by D2 you want to start treating the tooth, but certainly in that D1 zone. Then depending upon the caries risk of the patient, uh, you know, I might start talking about remineralization and or, you know, the flossing along with the fluoride uh, rinse, uh, you know, fluoride products that have nanoparticle hydroxyapatite in them as well. 
you know, talking about that versus talking about a res restoration, at least giving them that option. So remobilization is certainly one of our uh, therapeutic options here. When we look at strategies in terms of different medicaments, uh, again, we, you know, we start talking about fluoride, uh, but antimicrobial strategies, um, I, I prefer sodium hypochlorite. Uh, sodium hypochlorite is a safe, effective antimicrobial agent. It has a broad spectrum of activity. It does not produce any adverse reactions or persistent bacteria. So um, it's the least likely to do that. So uh, it's being used and recommended a lot for treating periodontal disease by uh, Jorgen Slots and has been for years, and that's really what piqued my interest and got me starting to use it um, early on, like you know, 12 years ago or so. So sodium hypochlorite is certainly uh, my go-to antimicrobial agent. I know that some people are using chlorhexidine, um, and there's been a lot of research done on chlorhexidine. So you know, it, it has some other of its own issues, but that's uh, certainly a, another option for you out there. Um, we did a three-year clinical trial um, in Queensland, Australia, and Townsend, um, and we looked at uh, school-aged children. There were two carries, high carries risk groups. We treated one with a standard, you know, 0.05 percent fluoride rinse, and the other with the carry, uh, the carry-free uh, CTX4 treatment rinse. And we reduced over a three-year period in the treatment group. We reduced their uh, carries index by 73 percent. And so uh, I feel very comfortable recommending and use, using this product. Obviously, it doesn't taste great, but uh, but it's effective and we know that it works. Um, you know, the other thing about sodium hypochlorite, uh, twice weekly rinses, and this was another study that Jorgen Slots was involved in, reduces the amount of plaque buildup on the teeth, and uh, they've, they've really looked at plaque buildup and periodontal disease, but just knowing that you get that kind of reduction with sodium hypochlorite, and you're going to see those results on your patients as well. So. Um, the other thing we know about sodium hypochlorite, I mean, we've been using it in root canals for almost 100 years probably. Uh, sodium hypochlorite, uh, we know that it also dissolves, and this is actually an SEM from Graham Milicic in New Zealand uh, with an in situ biofilm uh, that he actually grew in his mouth and then used the treatment rinse on, and you can actually see that it's starting to dissolve the biofilm. So that we know that um, sodium hypochlorite, one of the greatest challenges we have with biofilms is trying to get anything to penetrate the biofilm and to get deep into the biofilm to actually produce any result. Uh, and we know that one advantage of sodium hypochlorite is that it also, did one of the things that it is capable of doing is dissolving the biofilm as well. So I think that's one of the reasons why it's so effective. Um, another agent you could be using is xylitol. I strongly encourage that. We've had an entire webinar on xylitol. I know that there's uh, some very strong feelings for and against uh, xylitol. It's a five-carbon uh, sugar alcohol, and you know we know a lot of xylitol has been studied a lot. We know a lot about it. Um, we know that from a lot of the Scandinavian countries and studies that have been done, it reduces the transmission of mutant streptococci from the child to the mother. Um, certainly, um, if we look at a number of the studies, we know that it it um, potentiates even very low levels of fluoride. Uh, so one of my thoughts is, you know, we should always be coupling these things together. Uh, the more of these you can put together in one product, I think, the better. Uh, certainly it doesn't tell you which one of them. You go back to the Featherstone study, you know, which one is producing the result. Well, when you've got three or four things in there, you can't really tell. Uh, but at the same point in time, if you get an increased result of, as a result of, of um, taking a shotgun approach with lots of medicaments in a single product, uh, so much the better. So that, that, that information has been around for over 10 years. They have synergistic effects. Now this was published in 2013 in January. This is the exact study, uh, the xylitol for adult carries trial. Uh, it was a three multi-site study over a 33-month period of time, 691 adults. They took high carries risk adults. I think they were from age uh, 18 to age 75. And all they did was gave them five xylitol mints a day. And at the end of the 33 months, there was no outcome. And that everybody jumped on the bandwagon that, you know, xylitol doesn't work. We told you it didn't work. It's bad. It's whatever. Um, and everybody saw this study. The, the challenge we've got is that uh, they went back and did secondary analysis on that data. And they looked at just the patients in the study that had root surface lesions. And what they found was that those five xylitol mints a day in the um, 
group that had roots that, that were high risk for dental caries, but their location of their lesions were on root surfaces primarily, just those five xylitol minutes a day reduced their decay rate by 40%. So we really need to start thinking about not only in our research, but in our private practices, targeting our therapies to the patients that we know it's going to provide the best outcome for. So if you've got a patient that's got a lot of root surface decay, you know, five xylitol mints a day might be a really good idea to suggest for them to do as part of their part of their therapy. You know, I mean, we should you know maybe be recommending that for that patient. Uh, there have been a lot of studies that show that it works. There have been a lot of studies that show that xylitol didn't have an effect. This was a study that was published uh, almost two years ago. They took a an ADA approved toothbrush, a, a xylitol saturated. Um, Denifrus that was given to each patient and a short music video and it actually there was a dramatic reduction in plaque levels. Now it wasn't because of the brush, the supervision of the brushing uh, with the video and was it the music or was it the xylitol? I mean, you know, that's anybody's guess, but it did provide a, a, a significant reduction in plaque levels using xylitol and tooth brushing. Uh, if you look at the um, Cochrane study, the report that came out, they found weak levels of evidence uh, that uh, xylitol and fluoride toothpaste were better than just standard fluoride toothpaste. So, um, yeah, and, I, and we've gotten through that before. So, but anyway, xylitol is is certainly something that you could be recommending if the patient's going to chew gum. I tell them to chew xylitol gum. You know, if you chew gum, switch to xylitol. Um, now, when we talk about how are we going to correct the pH and, and is that as a therapy? You know, when you think about it, their bacteria, the acidic bacteria in their mouth and their diet. You know. The sugars in their diet produce acid. The saliva is uh, alkaline stimulated saliva, has a pH of like 8.0. And then you've got other bacteria present in the biofilm as well that help raise the pH. Should get back to neutral so that we have these periods of demineralization, but those should be balanced with periods, with periods of remineralization. So pH is really important. The other thing we know from Philip Marsh's work from way back in the late 1980s is that if prolonged periods of low pH actually select for acid uric bacteria. And so the biofilm shifts, like the makeup of the biofilm shifts as a result of the pH itself. And on top of that, the behavior of the biofilm. We know that from Takahashi and Nived. Um, a number of their papers indicate that within 30 minutes of being acidified in that, in that biofilm, a number of bacteria um, switch and become, instead of being like, you know, normal healthy bacteria, switch and become acid uric and start producing acid just with the same mechanisms and they look, they're indistinguishable from strep mutants. So you've got, not only does it select for bad players, it even turns good players into bad players. So that those prolonged periods of low pH um, are problematic. Now we, we have always identified that the critical pH of enamel is 5.5 and the critical pH of fluoridated enamel is 4.5 and that's that's true uh, in the big sense but what you really need to know is that depending upon how much saliva and how much um, calcium phosphate those nanoparticles of hydroxyapatite and fluorapatite that they have in their saliva like the more mineral they have in their saliva the lower that critical pH becomes so having it, having more mineral there helps create an environment that they can actually the enamel survives at lower pHs. So it's and so also on the other end of the spectrum, having less saliva or less mineral in the saliva raises that critical pH. So the critical pH may be six or six point five. Um, so it's really important for us to think about. It isn't just static at five point five. That person has xerostomia or hyposalivation. We've got an issue there, and their critical pH may not be 5.5. It may be 6.5. And we know the critical pH of uh, cementum is already 6.7 uh, in general, and, um, and your resting saliva on average is about 6.75. So if you've got a patient with exposed root surfaces, we really have no margin for error, um, very little margin for error. So the enamel critical pH is something for us to think about, but in terms of how much saliva they have. Um, trying to maintain one of the one of the entire focuses we have and, and concepts we have behind all the carry fruit products is to raise the pH in the mouth. Um, a lot of products are acidic, and it's a, about 
um, making products shelf life stable, and it's easier to do that and less expensive to manufacture them. But raising the pH, we then more mimic saliva in the body and try and keep that uh, pH in the mouth around neutrality. And what that helps do then also too is select for healthier bacteria and help create more periods of remineralization. And this was a study that was published last year by Philip Marsh. And in the top panel, those black spots are acid uric bacteria. In the bottom panel, the same thing. But all the, the only difference between those two panels is on they treated that, that panel with just raising the pH periodically over a period of days. And that actually selected for and helped eliminate some of those acid uric bacteria. So we can actually start to shift the biofilm at, with using pH as a strategy. So it's really important for us in our products to really think, too, about trying to help that patient raise the pH. Um, and again, there aren't a lot of products on the market that do that, but that's certainly one of the core strategies of all of the carry all of the carry free products is trying to you know work on pH buffering in the mouth. Um, and we also know that within the within the biofilm itself, there is a pH gradient and there's clustering of bacteria uh, within the biofilm. Um, it, it, I, there are a number of studies. In fact, I, I think we presented the study in the first webinar leading up to this one about just looking at, you know, these bacteria, it's not random. Those bacteria grow in a regular pattern in your mouth and my mouth and everybody's mouth. And they're located in certain um, communities within that biofilm. There are certain neighbors that are always found together and next to each other. And so, um, so again, pH certainly becomes a strategy that we can apply in our therapeutics. And this was a study that was published last year, uh, Terry Donovan's group. and they looked at all of the dry mouth products that were out there on the market and looked at the pH and then looked at their demineralization effect of using, potentially using those products. And you can see that the C2X spray had the, uh, the highest pH and it also had the uh, demineralization effect that was about the same as tap water, which was zero. So that was very favorable results, but we would expect that from that spray, which has a, a high pH. So it just points out the importance of us thinking about pH in terms of our therapies and our, and our recommendations. I talked about bottled water a lot before. You know, I always tell patients, you know, I told this patient uh, tonight, you know, the best thing you can do to, during the day is drink water. Uh, if you want your coffee with sugar in it, drink it and, and eat breakfast, gulp it, get it out of your mouth. I mean, drink it and get it over with. And if you want to have a Coke, drink it at lunch, and again, drink it. But you know, this patient was unfortunately sipping the coffee all morning long until it got really cold, then opening a Coke, and then sipping Coke all the rest of the day. Well, that's you know, the sugar and that continuous exposure is a recipe for disaster, and that's prim primarily exactly what's going on in her mouth. So, but again, water. Then, if you're just going to sip, you know, these bottled waters, a lot of them are very acidic. So, tap water is the best thing to drink. Just buy yourself a re refillable container, um, hydro flask. And don't hit your front tooth through the hydro flask. <laughs> I saw that patient yesterday with a broken front tooth. Uh, but you know, take take that and just use tap water. It's free. It has a pH of about 7.15, and it probably has fluoride in it, depending upon where you live. Um, what about nanoparticles of hydroxyapatite? Again, that's what's found in your saliva. Uh, 20 nanometer particle size of hydroxyapatite is what your body uses to help maintain the mineralization of your teeth. Um, and your saliva is super saturated with that. So when we start looking at studies on nanohydroxyapatite, uh, we found that it's biomimetic for the composition, size, structure, and morphology on prismatic hydroxy, hydroxyapatite enamel. Now these studies have been going on now for you know six, seven years. Um, this was one of the first studies we did with uh, when we started um, using the nanohydroxyapatite in the carry-free gels, and we found that just within a 24-hour period, we already saw deposition of, of new hydroxyapatite on the surface of artificial lesions that we created um, in vitro. Uh, and then there have been studies that have been done comparing uh, nanohydroxyapatite and its remineralizing effects, comparing it to fluoride. And you know some of these studies are pretty interesting. In this study, nanohydroxyapatite was better than fluoride at remineralization on these teeth. And in looking at a review of the literature, and you know, I first read that I thought, wow, that's really interesting. And then it's like, well, it should be. Uh, that's what the teeth are made of. The teeth aren't made of fluoride; they're actually made of nanoparticles hydroxyapatite. That is the building block, and that's how nature does it. I mean, that's how intelligent God, intelligent design, nature, 
evolution, whatever your belief system is, it's been going at it for billions of years and worked it out. And that's the, the most effective way. And so that's the most stable form of hydroxyapatite is in a 20 nanometer particle size, by the way, just coincidentally. Uh, so that's kind of an interesting little fact for you as well. Um, so remineralization therapies in this study, uh, none of them, they created these artificial lesions, and none of them actually reached back to the surface market micro-hardness that they started with, but they, you know, they then looked at the remineralization and certainly the nano, uh, particle hydroxyapatite was equal to fluoride uh, toothpaste in this study. Uh, and there have been a number of studies done like this, and this one was, again, comparing nanohydroxyapatite and fluoride, and also looked at uh, CPP, ACP, uh, recaldent uh, in the product as well, and found that uh, the nano nanoparticle hydroxyapatite was, again, equal to fluoride, and they concluded that the um, MI paste essentially could be used as an adjunct to fluoride, but couldn't be used in, in place of it. So the nan nanoparticle hydroxyapatite is at least as good, if not better, than fluoride. Wow. And we actually got done ahead of schedule here tonight. This is awesome. Uh, so I'll have time for a few questions. But at the end of the day, uh, then, uh, it's all about balance. It really comes down to you got to have a healthy balance in that mouth. And I'm really talking about a balance of pH. And then you look at why is the mouth out of balance. And if you can identify that, then you can start to look at therapies that can help address the patient getting it back in balance. On the next, um, on our next webinar, we're going to continue this discussion and then go into behavioral issues like diet and home care and how do we help the patient in coaching, how do we go through that and help that patient accomplish those tasks. And again, we'll follow the same patient through this whole process to kind of give you a feel for, you know, what does that look like. So, Lacey, uh, that's our presentation for tonight. And, um, I'm excited. I'm excited to have some questions. Yeah, yeah. I'm glad we have a little time left. Um, so the first question, if a patient wants to continue using the treatment rinse for more than two years, is there a risk of creating resistant bacteria? That's a really good question. Um, and, and I know, <laughs> and I'm excited because I know the answer to this one. Um, <laughs> no, it, it, it appears, that the answer to that question is no. Um, and, and the reason, and I, I say that for a couple of different reasons. Number one is um, the study that we did was a three-year trial where these uh, students were using the rinse in school every day. Now, recognize that was four days a week and uh, nine months out of the year. But So they were using it over a period of three years. And we saw a continued improvement in their carry scores uh, up through two years, and then it just maintained beyond that. So. Uh, after three years, there really wasn't any additional benefit, but there was no there was no harm. And if you look at the work that um, certainly Jorgen Slots has done um, at, at USC uh, in peri treating periodontalities and just looking at biofilms, it certainly has not created any persistent bacteria or had any adverse reactions. Uh, so it's a it's it's a very safe, effective. Um, antimicrobial agent that doesn't produce adverse effects and it doesn't doesn't appear to create any resistant bacteria. Now, I'm not really sure that a patient would have a long-term benefit from using that, particularly in dental caries. Um, like I say, two years is probably the maximum window that you want to treat a patient with it. Um, but at the same point in time, you know, you need, you may periodically want to use it on a patient depending upon what their risk factors are, um, you know, maybe for a lifetime. You know, maybe you've got somebody that's got Sjogren's syndrome, or maybe they have uh, severe xerostomia and they're on medications you can't change and maybe you want them to use it one week a month, uh, like six months out of the year every other month or, or some regimen like that. But using it certainly every day for two years, I don't know that I don't know there's going to be an additional benefit, but it's certainly from all the from everything that we know about it with sodium hypochlorite, doesn't appear that there can be any harm. Okay. Um, next question: If my patient you know, has, Lacey, can I yeah. can I interrupt you for just a second? Because this actually brings up and this actually brings up a really another good question. Uh, because I've heard a couple of researchers um, that I won't name, but uh, that state without any scientific evidence whatsoever 
that to kill all of the bacteria, like to you know use a broad spectrum antimicrobial agent in the mouth, is the patients then the just the uh, bad bacteria will come back and the patient will continue to get worse and worse. And like just the bad bacteria will come back. And I'm like, I'm listening to this and you know, I'm like, that doesn't even make any sense. Uh, I, they have no scientific evidence to support that, number one. And number two, it's nonsensical. It's like if you reduce the overall bacterial load with a broad spectrum antimicrobial agent, the early adopt if you've got the right environment, the early adopters come back first. And that's how I mean that's how biofilms, that's how they work. I mean when you brush your teeth, you know, you, you, you reduce all of the bacterial load in your mouth. The bad bacteria don't just grow back. Every time we did anything to reduce our bacterial load, uh, if if that was true, the patient would continue to get worse until they all their teeth fell out, decayed and fell out, or if it was something systemic in the body, every time we gave a patient a broad spectrum um, antibiotic, the patient would just get worse and die. And that doesn't happen. So it's like it's the craziest thing. But I've heard them, you know, we need to target which bacteria we're taking out. Really, well, which ones are those? Because now we've identified something like 54 bacteria that play a role in this disease. And it's like, how are you going to do that? Number one and number two. Uh, I've had really good results with this broad spectrum antimicrobial agent. So anyway, I just wanted to get that off my chest because that's another question because people are going to hear that and it's like, I, I, you know, I can't even believe that a scientist isn't more knowledgeable than to make a claim like that. Anyway, so yeah. I'm done. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> Okay, um, next question. If my patient has xerostomia, does the re recommendation change as far as which remineralization agent they should use? Yeah, so I think uh, that's another, oh, we get some great questions on these webinars. That's another really great question. And I would tell you that based on some of the science that I showed you tonight, it's the way that nature worked out remineralizing your teeth and the critical pH of enamel is all related to the amount of saliva and the amount of mineral that you have. When I say mineral, I'm talking about carbonated nanoparticles of hydroxyapatite that are 20 nanometers in average size. That mimics nature. And that's how the body does it. And so if we can copy that, I, I, I don't think we're smarter than a couple billion years of nature, if, if you want my opinion. Um, and so literally, if we can copy that, and so based on the other studies that I showed tonight, and I didn't, and there's several more, but comparing remineralization effect of nanoparticle hydroxyapatite straight up to fluoride and, and finding, and not surprisingly, when we stop and think about it, that nanohydroxyapatite was equal to or better than fluoride in the studies uh, for remineralization, I would say if you've got a patient that's got xerostomia, um, it's more important to have them on a nanoparticle hydroxy appetite product than it is to be on fluoride. Uh, I, I'm sure that some of my colleagues would say that's heresy, but in my mind, I would use both, right? Like I'm going to put that person on a, a gel like the CTX4 gel that has both. It's got the correct amount of, of uh, nanoparticle hydroxy appetite in the correct size, um, and it's also got 5,000 parts per million of fluoride. I mean, I would put that xerostomic patient on that. But if you had to ask me, based on what I see in the science in the last year, what's the more important of those two, it would be the nanoparticle hydroxyapatite. So yes, the answer is yes. But um, rather than just using a fluoride gel for a patient like that or and some other calcium you know, phosphate product, I would, I mean, based on the scientific literature, I'm going with nanoparticle hydroxyapatite and fluoride. I hope that, I hope that, that, that should be pretty logical to everybody after what you know what I presented tonight. Yeah. Okay. okay. La last question we have time for is the recommendation for treatment different for someone with more overall bacteria versus someone with more bacteria activity? Is the recommendation for treatment different for someone that has more overall bacterial load versus somebody that has just a highly active biofilm? Is that the question? Right. Yeah. Okay. That's another really good question. <laughs> okay, and the answer to that is yes, the treatment is different. Um, and I would tell you, um, well, I mean, let me let me think about this for a second. Um, obviously, the patient that has um, 
The answer is yes. And obviously the patient has the more, more just overall bacterial load. Typically you're going to see that patient has a lot of plaque buildup on their teeth and I'm going to address home care. Like that's going to be a major, uh, one of the major things we're going to focus on with that patient is home care. Um, and the patient that has highly active biofilm may not have any bacteria. I mean, you're going to see this. You're going to see patients, you're going to swab their teeth and they look like a hygienist for crying out loud. They've got spotless clean teeth and you don't see any plaque at all and you get a really high ATP score, there's something else going on there. And typically it's a matter of saliva, more so than diet. I would say you're probably looking at saliva as being the issue for that patient. So um, they're both going to get put on a, an antimicrobial agent, but I'm going to be more focused on home care uh, with the patient that, and I could literally pull up, I, I don't have them here, but you know, that's a really good question. I could show you slides that literally the, both patients had a high ATP scores and the one person had green carpet growing on their teeth and the other person looked like your hygienist smile. I mean, she literally had no plaque on her teeth whatsoever and they both had high ATP scores and they were both high risk for caries and both getting about two and a half new cavi cavities per year in their mouths. So for, and actually as it turned out for that patient, it, it was a salivary issue and it was medication related. Uh, two different medications that are um, create hyposalivation. So, you know, I didn't need with that patient to even discuss home care. Her home care was as good as mine. I mean, she flossed twice a day uh, in addition to brushing. But for her, it was really more a matter of, okay, we need to ship this biofilm and we need to start supporting and getting, um, you, helping her be really aware of acidic episodes in her mouth in terms of how often she snacks and what she's eating during the day and then how much water she's drinking and uh, being able to use, you know, reinforce and using neutralizing products, uh, the alkaline products that are going to raise the pH in her mouth and even like a spray uh, a couple times in between meals during the day just to help replace what she's missing because of the lack of saliva. So, uh, yeah, so that's a great question and I hope that answer made sense because yeah. those are, those can be two very different patients with very different reasons for their high ATP scores, but they're both, I use the ATP to determine whether or not I'm going to use an antimicrobial agent. If they've got a high ATP score, I'm, I'm starting with the antimicrobial agent. If they've got a low ATP score uh, and, they're, and they're high risk for caries, well, that, what that tells me is it's not a bacterial issue. I've got something else going on there. And I start examining, looking closer into their uh, medications that they're taking, their saliva, and then their diet. So, um, so that, that's how I would uh, answer that question. Again, that's a very, a very good question. All right. Well, thank you, Dr. Cooch, and thank you to everyone for joining us tonight. We weren't able to get to everyone's questions, so look for the answers to those in the next few days. Um, if there's part of the webinar you want to hear again, we'll also be sending out a recording soon. And please contact us if you'd like to learn more about implementing carry-free into your practice. So thanks again for joining us, and have a wonderful evening. Thank you, everybody, and have a great rest of the summer. Thank you.